It's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. My uh, question, uh, Speaker, to the Premier. Premier, when I um, grew up in the North End of Fort Erie, I think to most of my friends' parents, their moms or dads usually worked at the factory. They worked at the plant. Manufacturing helped to build our middle class, the backbone of communities like those that I grew up in. There's a long story list of manufacturing that has left our province. Navistar has left Chatham to go to Indiana. Extrad has left Timmins to go to Quebec. John Deere left our area in Niagara for Wisconsin. Siemens left Hamilton to go to Charlotte, North Carolina. Caterpillar left London to go to Indiana. I could spend my entire time, sadly, reciting this list. Premier, there have been 300,000 manufacturing job losses in a province. These products, Premier, are still being made. They're being made in North America, but they're being made everywhere but the province Question. of Ontario. Why is that happening, and where is your plan to actually bring those jobs back to our great province? <laughs> Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, and I know that the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition will want to hear the list of uh, businesses that have come to Ontario and jobs that have been created in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. But before I go through that, I want to acknowledge that there has been a shift in manufacturing in Ontario. There is no doubt about that. The fact that we decided as a government to support the auto industry, Mr. Speaker, the, the fact that we have put in place regional development funds, Mr. Speaker, to work with businesses so that they can make the shift to advance manufacturing, initiatives all of which the opposition voted against, Mr. Speaker, and did not support. We have recognized that there is a change. There's a change in the global economy. There's a change in Ontario's economy, Mr. Speaker, and we believe that the best thing that we can do. Order. Carry on. That the best thing that we can do, Mr. Speaker, is to work with businesses Sir. to create an environment so that business will come here. We have four, over 400,000 net new jobs Thank in Ontario since 2009. We need to keep. Thank you. I, uh, I, I'm moving right to identifying writings. Uh, supplementary, please. Um, Premier, the problem is that Ontario used to be at the top of the list. Yeah, exactly. Put best in the job creation. And under an Ontario PC government, we'll be at the top of the list exactly. again. I don't think that the, the Liberal government understands the importance of manufacturing and resource development to our economy. You can do all the research and development in the world, but unless you make something at the end of the day, it's about as useful as a two-legged stool. We have a plan to bring in 300,000 advanced manufacturing jobs to strengthen the middle class and not the liberal jobs that are part-time, temp job to temp job with no, no wages or benefit increases. We actually see good, strong middle-class jobs you can count on. We've got a plan to do so. Last week, they had to continue with the loss of jobs in Leamington, Ontario. There have been 38,000 job losses under your leadership as Premier manufacturing alone. Premier, I'll ask Minister you again, Affairs, the economy, why are they growing manufacturing everywhere else but the Thank province you. of Ontario? <laughs> Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Prima. And uh, you know, I want to, I want to just to share the from Holton, we'll come to order. Position. Uh, in my conversation on Friday with the uh, with the community leaders and the business folks from the Leamington area, that your your member attended that meeting, Mr. Speaker. It was a very important meeting. Of course, we're disappointed with the decision that Heinz made around the Leamington plant, so Mr. Speaker, Sunderland, but order. we will work with that community, and I believe that there are many, many possibilities for that community. But, Mr. Speaker, make no mistake, the leader of the opposition and his party would cut and slash across the Lampton, board. Higher civil servants, Mr. Speaker, they would take workers out of education, out of health care, Mr. Speaker, and they would engage in a race to the bottom, Mr. Speaker, in terms of working conditions and wages and benefits. Because, Mr. Speaker, the member from the Fee and Carlton come to order. The member from Dufferin Caledon come to order. Finish, please. We are not going to engage, Mr. Speaker, in that race to the bottom. It is not responsible. The gains that organized labor have Sir. made in this province over the previous decades, Mr. Speaker, will not be lost by this government, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. 
You know, if you had worked at Heinz, if you had worked at Caterpillar, if you had worked at Volvo and Goderich and went to Pennsylvania, Gracious Living opening their plant in New York, if you lost your job at Extrada, Premier, we have hit rock bottom. The Liberals are winning the race to rock bottom. My plan to put Ontario back on top, to bring in 300,000 advanced manufacturing jobs, forestry, mining, manufacturing. And here's the other thing. You um, blew the cliff steel. This chance it could have been with the oil sands in Alberta, you fumbled the ball. We lost those jobs. That investment will go elsewhere. And the very same day that Cliffs walked away from the table, they said high energy rates part of that equation, Heinz high energy rates. You spent your time hugging it up with Al Gore. The very policies that drove hydro rates Question. through the roof in the first place. Don't you think? Considering the impact of hydro on jobs, that was a poke in the eye. Wasn't that salt in the wounds? Wasn't that an extraordinary misjudgment to embrace the high energy policies that are prior to the Both sides are not helpful. <laughs> Member from Renfrew will come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is extremely important that the people of Ontario listen to what the Leader of the Opposition just said, Mr. Speaker, because underlying what the Leader of the Opposition just said is this. He believes, by what he just said, that we cannot have clean air in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. He believes, Mr. Speaker, that we have to sacrifice the environment to— Order, please. about people losing their jobs. I care deeply about bringing jobs to Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I care deeply about working with businesses, but not, Mr. Speaker, to sacrifice our children's health, Mr. Speaker. There is no, there is no place for policies in this province that would sacrifice children to the economy, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. A member from Barry. Speaker, my question this morning is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. I repeat, I've repeatedly asked the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games for the real numbers on the Pan Am uh, Games after painstakingly undercover, uh, uncovering multiple budgets. Finally, last week we got somewhere. The minister admitted to ballooning costs up to one, up the $1.4 billion budget to $2.56 billion. But we know the spending doesn't stop there, uh, Premier. What scares me is that the Liberals are cutting deals with their enablers over here to cancel investigation into the minister's lackluster management of the Pan Am Games. Speaker, when will the Premier tell us exactly what she is hiding, and will she tell it to us now? Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, I think the, uh, the member opposite has, uh, has demonstrated that we have provided information. We've provided the information that, uh, that he has asked for. Um, the, uh, the government doesn't set salaries for the, uh, the TO 2015 employees, Mr. Speaker. That's not an agency of the government, but we have absolutely provided the information that the, uh, the member opposite has asked for. What, what is really important, Mr. Speaker, is that we understand that, uh, that the, the investments in the Pan Am Games are investments that are going to pay off over the long term, Mr. Speaker. There will be legacies of these games, Mr. Speaker, in the terms of affordable housing. 
housing, in terms of venues, and of Answer. course, Mr. Speaker, we have to be accountable for the expenditures. But, Mr. Speaker, it would be great if the party opposite had some enthusiasm about this fantastic game and legacy that are going to be in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Kids are going to be paying this. For Premier, we're very excited about the years. games. We're just not excited about your mismanagement of them. Uh, Speaker, this government is saving themselves from the scrutiny of cancelling the Pan Am investigation in General Government Committee. Ironically, the very vocal third-party Pan Am critic has sold out to make this possible. He traded Pan Am accountability for support for his union-friendly bill, which effectively cancelled this investigation. As the government continues to point out, we're just having the people's games. But just so we all know, it's also the people's money premier. Will the Premier stop hiding and commit today to continuing the Pan Am investigation into the accountability of the Pan Am Secretariat? Yes or no? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the uh, government House Leader is going to want to speak to the discussions that are going on at the committee in the uh, final supplementary. But what I want to say, Mr. Speaker, is that it, it is extremely important that the questions be asked, that we be accountable for the money that's being invested. And, Mr. Speaker, to this point, the, uh, the projects are all on time and under budget. Mr. Speaker, and as the minister has said many times, it's often the capital projects that cause the problem in games like this. Mr. Speaker, that is not the case. We are we are seeing a very good trajectory for those projects, and we expect that as the other costs and the other investments are made, the same will hold true. Mr. Speaker, 41 countries and their athletes are going to be here, Mr. Speaker, in 2015. This is the biggest event that we have held on Ontario soil. We are enthusiastic about it. We hope that the party opposite will get on board, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, this government has not been accurate with the numbers since the beginning. They have not been forthcoming with any of the proper numbers for the Pan Am Games that admitted that they're going to balloon in the coming years. The Liberals do not want Pan Am Games investigated. Clearly, clearly the NDP doesn't either. And their committee maneuvering proves that they will go to any length to avoid accountability for their compulsive spending habits. This includes the manipulation of the vocal third-party Pan Am critic who's bought with support for his union-loving bill in exchange for cancelling the Pan Am investigation. We want successful games and respect for the hard-working families went I, uh, I'm very concerned about that last statement. I'd ask you to withdraw. Withdrawn. Premier, allow the investigation into the Pan Am management or ask the minister to step down. You choose. What are you trying to hide? Mr. Speaker, we are trying to make this legislature work. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is the Estimates Committee and the General Government Committee are both looking into the Pan Am uh, Games. There were literally thousands of documents that were delivered to the Estimates Committee, the first tranche that went forward. We at General Government are looking at a way that we can look at Pan Am and also look at some very important legislation, Bill 105, which will reduce taxes for businesses in this province. But the Progressive Conservative Party, Mr. Speaker, is playing games. Order. They won't allow Oh, the, the member from Simcoe Gray will come to order. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it is a pattern there. Filibustering in committees so the Prince taxes Edward cannot Hastings be cut for small order. businesses. And the other night, Mr. Speaker, the bravery awards order. given out by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario yes, were delayed by 20 minutes because oh. of the bell ringing antics of the opposition, oh. Mr. Speaker. We are trying to make this work. Member, uh, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My first question is to the Premier. Yesterday, I asked the acting Premier if the Liberal government signed an initial agreement or term sheet with Cliffs Natural Resources. The acting Premier wouldn't even tell us whether one existed. So today, I'll ask the Premier: Did the government have an agreement with Cliffs? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the uh, the leader of the third party uh, asked this question yesterday. I know that she knows that what she's referring to is commercially sensitive and some personal information, Mr. Speaker. I know that she's aware of that. We're going to continue to work diligently to make sure that we're ready to support development in the Ring of Fire. That is our commitment. That is where our commitment has been all along, Mr. Speaker. But I think that asking for asking for information that is rightly confidential, Mr. Speaker, does not advance the cause of the relationship and the development of the Ring of Fire in any way. Here, here. Supplementary. 
Well, we would love to see the cause be advanced in some way, Speaker. The Liberals don't seem to be able to advance it at all. In May 2012, the Finance Minister confirmed the government had reached an agreement with Cliffs regarding plans to process chromite in Capriol. Either the minister was mistaken or this agreement, agreement exists. If it does, what commitments did the Liberals make in that term sheet, Speaker? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the reality is that there were yeah, there were discussions and there were uh, there were terms of reference for that for those discussions. But, Mr. Speaker, there was a lot of commercially sensitive information that was part of that discussion, and that commercially sensitive information is not. Uh, is not available, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to work to develop the Ring of Fire. We are uh, setting up the Development Corporation, as the Minister of uh, uh, Mining, Nat Northern Development and Mines, has uh, has spoken about. We are not backing away from our commitment to uh, to develop this very rich deposit, Mr. Speaker. And I know that there are they are there are mayors from communities uh, in the north who are here today who are going to be meeting with uh, various of us who are very very interested in that yes, commitment sir. because it has to do with infrastructure, it has to do with economic development, and it has to do with the capacity of the North to create the jobs that we know are necessary. That's why we're not Thank stepping you. away, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, a KWG Resources press release indicates that the term sheet the government signed with Cliffs included commitments to a, quote, attractive electricity rate, as well as commitments to build a road to move people, equipment and ore in and out of the Ring of Fire. We know none of these things have happened, Speaker. Did the government make those commitments? Again, Mr. Speaker, there were arrangements that were made. There was a discussion that happened with a business, Mr. Speaker, and we we were very clear that uh, that we were pleased about that. It's unfortunate that for their own business model, their own reasons, Mr. Speaker, Cliffs has stepped away. But there are other companies, Mr. Speaker, who are interested in working with the government, and we look forward to working with them. I also, Mr. Speaker hope that the federal government will be a partner in the development of the Ring of Fire. This has been the situation yeah, all along, Mr. Speaker, that we need the federal government, who in fact have sung the praises of the Ring of Fire, have talked about what a huge opportunity it is, Mr. Speaker, and how involved they are. In fact, they are not as involved as they need to be. We need them at the table with us as we work with First Nations, as we work with municipalities, as we work with commercial interests. So we look forward to those partnerships allowing us to continue to work to develop the Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the Leader of the Third Party. Well, Speaker, blaming Ottawa is this Liberal government's the dog ate my homework excuse, and we hear it far too often in this legislature. My next question is for the Premier, Speaker. As a Cabinet Minister, the Premier herself went to Cape Real and announced thousands of jobs. Those were the government's words, Speaker, the government's words, thousands of jobs. People want to know what happened to those jobs. The government said they signed an agreement on behalf of the people of Ontario. Why won't the Premier release the agreement with Cliffs so Ontarians can see whether the Liberals actually lived up to their end of that agreement? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, you know, I, I understand that the uh, the leader of the third party um, is disappointed. We are disappointed as well, Mr. Speaker. That that goes without saying. But but the Ring of Fire is not about it's not about one company. It's not about one level of government, and you know the uh, the leader of the third party can chastise me for uh, for calling on the federal government. I think it's eminently responsible of us to call on the federal government to work with us. I'm not blaming the federal government. I say order, to the leader of the third party. What I'm saying is that if this extraordinary uh, if this extraordinary opportunity is going to be realized, we need all levels of government working together. We need to be working with First Nations. We need to be working with That's commercial right. interests because it is a massive Never development that requires that kind of partnership. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, in their letter, Cliffs, uh, their letter of uh, November 20, 2013, the press relief, Cliff says that they will continue to work with the Ontario government, First Nations communities, and other interested parties to explore potential solutions. Thank Related you. to the critical issue of infrastructure. Thank we look you. forward to continuing. Supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, as Liberals' uh, dithering and inaction has pushed cliffs away from the Ring of Fire, people are beginning to ask about the challenges that other companies are facing in the Ring of Fire. How many other term sheets has the government signed, and how many of these other companies are facing the same problems that push cliffs away, Speaker? So, you know, Mr. Speaker, when I was uh, when I was Minister of um, Aboriginal Affairs, I can remember in this house and in other uh, in other venues saying that the development of the Ring of Fire was a very complex issue, and it was going to require that we uh, that we understand the many moving parts. And one of those parts, Mr. Speaker, is the uh, the relationship with First Nations. And I said to my colleagues, and they will they will attest to this. I said very clearly that if if we did not move in a responsible and coordinated way, if we did not make sure that we had environmental issues dealt with and that we worked with First Nations, Mr. Speaker, we would not be able to, we would not be able to develop the Ring of Fire. And the member opposite uh, from Renfrew talks about, talks about delays, but Mr. Speaker, yes, the sir. reality is there are many complex issues that need to be dealt with in the development of the Ring of Fire. We are working on those, and we look forward to working with commercial interests. Thank including you. cliffs as we go forward. We're going Thank to develop you. the Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Finance told reporters that when it comes to the government's jobs plan, the net result is that it's working. For people in Cape Real who received an empty promise of thousands of jobs, or frankly the families in Leamington watching the cornerstone of their economy pack up and leave, the net result is that people aren't working. I know the Premier likes to run, but she can't run away from the fact that these jobs are her responsibility. When will the government stop passing the buck, stop playing politics, and admit that the status quo just isn't working when it comes to creating and protecting jobs in this province? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, again, I understand the rhetoric of the leader of the third party. In fact, in fact. It is the combined responsibility of the private sector and the public sector to work together. It is our responsibility as government to create the uh, to create the conditions so that the private sector can create jobs, Mr. Speaker. And I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to talk about some of the places where that is happening, Mr. Speaker, because I understand I'm concerned about what happened in happened in Leamington, and I know that the leader of the third party knows that I am. But I'm also pleased, Mr. Speaker, that in Ottawa, at Ericsson. Canada, there are new jobs, 35 new jobs, retaining 105. In Cambridge, Ontario, at Toyota, Mr. Speaker, uh, our investment of $16.8 million, Mr. Speaker, created approximately 400 jobs. In GM, Mr. Speaker, in Ingersoll, uh, over 2,500 jobs as a result of the $250 million investment that the government made. Green Arc Tire Manufacturing in St. Mary's, Ontario, Mr. Speaker, 340 jobs. There is a long list of job creation, Mr. Speaker. We will continue Thank to foster you. those conditions for job creation. New, new question, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I can't believe you're trying to blame the federal government for your failure in the Ring of Fire. I, like many of my colleagues, were dismayed at your comments over the weekend suggesting. Order. And yesterday in the House, your finance minister also tried to shift blame and refused to take any responsibility for the deal with cliffs falling through. Premier, your government was quick to take credit when you made the deal with cliffs. Your May 9, 2012, the member from Thunder Bay, quote, come to thousands order. of jobs coming to order. Citizenship to order. By taking credit for the Ring of Fire before delivering, you and your government deserve the lion's share of the blame for your failure. Premier, now that the dust has settled, who have you held accountable for the failure of your government on this issue? Uh, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I'm not blaming the federal government. Let me be really clear about that. I'm not blaming the federal government. What I'm saying, 
which is what we have said all along, is that there are many partners who are needed in order to be able to explore and exploit the, uh, the uh, resources and the, uh, the possibility of the Ring of Fire. It is impossible for one company or one order of government to do this, Mr. Speaker. It's a huge project, and from the beginning, we have said that we need the private sector, we need First Nations, and we need the federal government and municipalities to work with us so that we can so that we can develop that uh, that resource mr speaker that is not that is not inconsistent in fact it is consistent with what yes, we sir. have said from the beginning and i will be calling on uh, prime minister harper as i have already done to work with us we are <laughs> have i called him absolutely i've written to him and we're trying to set up a meeting so i look forward to that meeting i look forward to the opportunity to have a discussion with the uh, with the prime minister yes, about his role and about our combined partnership Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Again, the Premier, well, with your 2012 press release, you would have sworn the mine was about to open. And, Premier, with all the bureaucracy that your government has set up around this project, it's, it's no wonder you're having fi difficulty finding accountability. With overlapping ministries, the Ring of Fire Secretariat, panels, and a negotiator that you appointed, there's a lot of talk and very little action. In your 2012 press release, five different ministers and you yourself were quoted. Premier, had you taken the advice of our northern white paper, we wouldn't be in this place today. Why don't you do it now? Implement the PC plan and put a single minister in charge of the Ring of Fire. Thank you. Premier? Well, we, all, we won't implement the, uh, the outline that, uh, that, that the uh, opposition has laid out, Mr. Speaker, because it's simplistic. It does not recognize the complexity of the, uh, the development opportunity, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't recognize that there are many, as I said, many moving parts, Mr. Speaker. And I have said from the beginning, the beginning of this opportunity, that we have to work with, with all players in order for us to be successful. You know, when I traveled to Webekwe when I was the uh, when I was the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs and I met with the community there and we talked about the training opportunities, training opportunities that are being avail made available right now, Mr. Speaker. Those training opportunities are being set up and there are young people at Webekwe who are going to be able to be trained and will be ready to work in the Ring of Excellent. Fire as we explore, as we, uh, as we develop that resource, Mr. Speaker. That's the kind of process that's necessary. It takes time. I recognize that and it will be successful, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. A member from High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In a report released today, Campaign 2000 strongly condemns this government's 2012 decision to delay scheduled increases in the Ontario Child Benefit and to freeze the minimum wage. They blame these Liberal government decisions for the slow progress in reducing the child poverty in this province. In 2008, the government made grand statements to reduce child poverty by 25 per cent over five years, and in 2013, it is absolutely nowhere near achieving what is a very modest goal. How does this government justify its lack of action in reducing child poverty by 25 per cent? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Children and Youth Services, who uh, has responsibility for the poverty reduction strategy, will want to uh, speak to the supplementary. But I, I want to just say to the, uh, the member of the third party that she knows full well that it's our government that introduced a poverty reduction strategy in this province. We are the first government to have a poverty reduction strategy, Mr. Speaker. We have an Ontario Child Benefit because we introduced it, Mr. Speaker. And we implemented it, Mr. Speaker, and in fact, the child poverty rate in Ontario fell by n over 9% uh, during the height of the recession, Mr. Speaker. So I believe that the the member of the third party is talking about doing more and doing it more quickly. I understand that that would be uh, that would be her request, and I thank the uh, I thank Campaign 2000 Answer. for their report. But make no mistake, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to poverty reduction. We continue to be committed to poverty reduction and we will move Thank on you. future actions, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, again, to the Premier, uh, the Campaign 2000 document cites a number of other devastating cuts to supports for low-income people made by this government. For example, the 2012 Ontario budget saw the cancellation of benefits for people on social assistance, including health benefits and, tragically, the community startup and maintenance benefit. The government talked about reducing child poverty by 25 per cent in 2008, but this report, Mr. Speaker, makes it crystal clear that part of the blame for its failure lies in policy decisions made by this very government. How does the government finally, Mr. Speaker, explain those decisions to the hundreds of thousands of Question. Ontario children who go to bed hungry every night? Mr. Children Youth Services. Yes, sir, children and Youth Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question as well. I, too, would like to thank Campaign 2000 for the report that they released today. I, in fact, have met with Campaign 2000 on a number of occasions, and I share their concern with respect to our children and the future of this province. And I'd like to reiterate that it was this government that brought in the Ontario Children's Benefit that's paid out to 950,000 children. That's been directly related to the fall of 9.2 per cent of our child poverty rate. And the report says that we were successful in that during the, the height of the greatest recession that we've had. Ontario has the second lowest low income rate in the entire country, Speaker. We've lifted 47,000 children out of poverty and we prevented 61,000 children from getting into poverty. We have done a lot of work with respect to minimum wage, with respect to social assistance reforms, with respect Answer. to our housing benefits. Is there more work to do? Absolutely. And that's why we're creating a new poverty reduction strategy and why we're all working together to that end. I am absolutely committed to this. So thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, last Thursday the government announced it would be introducing the Ending Call for Cleaner Air Act. This important piece of legislation, if passed, would ensure that Ontario never returns to the days of using dirty coal fired plants to generate electricity for the province. This policy is one that I have had strong support for from the people of Ottawa Orleans for the last 10 years. The, last, the closure of the last coal plants in the province is, in my opinion, as an engineer and as a former business owner, a momentous achievement that will help protect the health and environment of Ontarians for generations to come. We must think of our children and our grandchildren. It is a significant landmark in the global fight against climate change. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Energy please inform the House about the importance of the bill that will be introduced by the Minister of Environment Question. later today? Minister. Thank the member for his support. Uh, last week, I had the pleasure of standing with the Premier, the Minister of the Environment, the Minister of Health, our host, Environmental Defence, and a special guest, former Vice President Al Gore, Al Gore. to announce our vision of a coal-free future for Ontario. With Nanticoke generating stations slated to close at the end of this year and the Thunder Bay generating station set for conversion to advanced biomass, Ontario will have a coal-free electricity system. And to ensure that we never go back to the days of burning dirty coal, our government introduced a bill that, if passed, will make it illegal for the province to burn coal for power. Mr. Speaker, our government is a global leader on this issue. We are the first jurisdiction in North America to accomplish this goal, and it's a cause for celebration for all Ontarians. Answer, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Now that we've reached this significant milestone, it is important to ensure that we don't go backwards. Climate change is an issue that is not going to disappear. And Ontario needs to remain a global leader going forward, because if nobody takes action, it will be impossible to avoid its catastrophic consequences. As Tim Gray, Executive Director of Environment, Environmental Defence, said, Ontario has shown the world that bold action on climate change can be done. Ontarians should feel proud to live in the first jurisdiction in North America that is kicking the coal habit, a place that today took immediate meaningful action on climate change. Mr. Speaker, getting off coal is not only a major triumph in the fight against climate change, but will also provide significant health benefits to the people of Ontario. Can the minister please tell us about the health and environmental benefits Question. of eliminating dirty coal fire generation in the province? Minister Speaker, getting off coal is the single largest climate change initiative in North America. It will save $4.4 billion in avoided environmental and health care costs. 
It's going to mean a better quality of life for people with asthma and less children and seniors suffering from air quality related illnesses. Exactly. It will mean fewer smog days and lower carbon emissions, equivalent to taking 7 million cars off the road. Seven Mr. million Speaker. cars. Finally, I would like to quote Mr. Gore when he was here last week. He said that future generations will ask, how did you find the moral courage to act against climate change? And part of the answer will be Ontario, Canada led the way. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What Thank you. Good question. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, Dr. Chris Mazza is under criminal investigation for his role in the Orange Air Ambulance scandal. He is under investigation by the College of Physicians and Surgeons for his unethical conduct as a physician. He pleaded mental incapacity when called to testify at the Public Accounts Committee and had to be brought here under a special Order. speaker's warrant. Frontline staff and patients were put at risk as a direct result of his gross mismanagement and fraudulent schemes and self-aggrandizement. Now we learn that he's back on the Ministry of Health payroll, working in the emergency ward at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Center. Speaker, how can the minister justify this offensive disrespect for the frontline staff at Orange, Question. for the patients whose lives were put at risk, and for the taxpayers of this province who were ripped off for millions as a result of this matter. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And uh, the member opposite knows full well that hiring decisions are made by hospitals, Speaker. Uh, they are made independently. Hospitals have the responsibility for the doctors that they hire. Uh, to suggest, Speaker, that uh, I, uh, I run the human resources departments in hospitals across this province is kind of ridiculous. I will say, Speaker, that in order for a doctor to be hired, order. he must be certified for the college, by the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, and, Speaker, I look forward to the supplementary where I can speak more. Thank you. Speaker, based on that response, I call into question the competency of whoever was doing the hiring at that hospital, and I call into, co into question the competency of this minister here, here. who allows it to happen. Exactly. Once again, she's pleading ignorance and that she has no authority. We've heard that throughout this entire file. She can do nothing. She has no authority. Speaker, apart from the obvious irreparable damage that was done to our emergency ambulance service and the harm that was done to the men and women who were forced to work under this man's tyranny, he traveled the world in the lap of luxury at taxpayers' expense. He saddled taxpayers with multi-millions of dollars of debt thanks to his mismanagement. Speaker, he should not be in an emergency ward. He should be in a jail. And this, minister, this minister stands by and tells us she has nothing to do with this issue. She has a responsibility to it. Thank you. Minister of Health, long term care. Well, uh, Speaker, I do find it strange that the member opposite is suggesting that we investigate, convict, and jail someone. Speaker, that's not how we do business on this side of the House. Let me reiterate hiring decisions are local decisions made by the local hospitals. The College of Physicians and Surgeons. Stop the clock, please. This is um, very difficult for me to uh, seize control at all when I've got members on the government side while the minister is answering, provoking, and the other people accepting the provocation and responding, not while the minister is answering or when the question is being put. I think it's uh, less than uh, polite. Finish, please. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And just uh, to reiterate, Physician accreditation is the sole and independent responsibility of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est également pour la. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Services. The centre has been in crisis for almost a month. This crisis means there are no beds available for patients to need to be admitted. It means cancelled surgery. It means patients are being cared for in hallways. The hospital is 54 beds over capacity 
and there are 64 people waiting for placement. The minister can talk a good game about investing in home and long-term care, but clearly this talk hasn't resulted in action on the ground. Can the minister explain what she is doing to address the crisis faced by Thunder Bay? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for this question. This is a question that uh, uh, has been raised by, uh, by my, my colleagues, the member for Thunder Bay Atacokan and the member from Thunder Bay Superior North. There is very much an issue in Thunder Bay. I could tell you that the Lynn and the hospital and the other providers in the area are very much focusing on resolving the issues that have been raised. Speaker, we have come a long way when it comes to providing more supports at home to free up hospital beds. But I must say, in Thunder Bay, I acknowledge that there is a problem that we are very focused on resolving. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the hospital in Thunder Bay is struggling and it's doing its best to cope, but they can only do so much when dozens of patients are stuck in hallways because they have nowhere to go. But in the hospital, hallway nursing is not quality care. This government promised to address wait time for home care, but clearly something is not working. We are just on the cusp of flu season, and Thunder Bay residents need to know that their hospital will be there for them in their time of need. I ask the Minister of Health again, what is her plan to address the health crisis in Thunder Bay? Thank you, Minister. Uh, well, uh, Speaker, uh, again, thank you to the member opposite. This is an issue, as I have said, that uh, has been brought to my attention by our, our members, the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, the member from Thunder Bay, Superior North. Our Lynn is very focused on resolving these issues. These are complex problems, Speaker. We are opening new long-term care beds in Thunder Bay. Uh, there is good progress being made, but clearly there is more to do, and we're committed to doing that work. My question is for the municipal, the municipal affairs and Mr. Jeffrey. National Housing Day, an important topic, a fundamental right for Ontarians because, of course, everybody deserves to have safe and secure housing. In my own riding of Etobicoke North, Speaker, our government has made significant investments, such as the recently finished renovations on affordable housing units at 2667 and 2677 Kipling Avenue. But, Speaker, as you'll appreciate, there is still more work to be done. This is especially important and part of a just society. When people are, live in safe and affordable housing, our communities thrive. Good housing promotes health, safety, physical and emotional well-being, and we know that children even do better in school. Speaker, through you to the minister, could she explain to my constituents in Etobicoke North Question. what investments are, is our government making to ensure that Ontarians have access to affordable housing? Thank you, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and I really want to thank the member for the question. Tackling homelessness is a very important issue to our government because there's nothing more distressing than the thought of a child a senior or a family being unsure where they're going to sleep at night. That's why we've invested over $3 billion in affordable housing since 2003. That investment is the largest in our province's history. It's meant that we've been able to create more than 17,000 affordable housing units and repaired more than a quarter of a million social and affordable housing units. By investing in Ontarians, we make sure that they have access to affordable housing and we can ensure that they're better prepared to enter the workforce. because. Having a place to call home is the first step out of poverty. It is the first step to realizing new opportunities. It is the first step to a better quality of life. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, I appreciate, uh, Madam Minister, your response about our government's investments. Ontario's most vulnerable, of course, deserve this. But, Speaker, I raise a genuine concern in this chamber for all parties to consider. Despite the significant investment that Ontario has made, the federal Conservative government has largely failed to tackle this, tackle this pressing issue. Canada remains the only G8 nation that does not have a national housing strategy, which of course undermines the progress that we have made in Ontario, leading to a piecemeal band-aid solution approach. The Feds also ignore calls from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities as well as the City of Toronto to have a stable and long-term funding source so that we can make the necessary long-term investments in affordable housing. Speaker, 
I would invite the minister Question. to please share with this chamber about her recent uh, excursion to Ottawa and the trip, the uh, meetings that she had with her counterparts at the federal level. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. While I was in Ottawa last week, I reiterated our government's call to the federal government to come up with a stable, long-term solution to homelessness in Ontario. But despite my invitation for a conversation, the minister failed to meet with me, oh. a failure that's occurred since December 2009, which was the last time the federal Conservatives sat down with the provinces and territories to talk about homelessness. This despite the fact last month Minister Candice Bergen told the National Homelessness Conference that the federal government is looking for even more ways to support communities in developing What's solutions to homelessness. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have a suggestion for Minister Bergen. Talk to the provinces. Exactly. Pick up the phone and talk to us. For too long, Ontarians have failed to receive the attention and the investments that we need and we deserve from the federal government. Answer. And our government will continue to stand up for Ontario's most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, my question to the, uh, the Premier. Uh, with respect to a, a new regional hospital in South Niagara. Uh, yesterday uh, was, um, as I termed it, uh, put up or shut up day when it comes to the new hospital in South Niagara. Yeah, you asked me why I say put up or shut up because you guys have been, you know, kind of on the fence in this issue. Witness um, the February uh, article in Niagara Falls Review, win off to Rocky start on the hospital file. Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne in her first week on the job threw cold water on the proposed South Niagara Hospital and set back hospital reform in Niagara for two years. So we're trying to get a more positive answer, get you off that fence uh, a little bit, Premier. And conveniently yesterday, when we had the put up or shut up motion in the House, Question. the Minister announced that she was finally looking at a programming grant for that hospital. So let me ask you this, how much exactly will that planning grant be worth? Thank you. When will we actually make that announcement? And is it actually budgeted? Thank you. Health budget? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Care. I cannot tell you how refreshing it is to hear the Leader of the Opposition advocating for hospital capital projects. Wow. You know, I have to say, this is just fantastic news. Now, it is interesting that he's focusing on one particular After hospital in a riding that hospital, happens to be in a by-election situation, but I'm sure his passion will be just as strong for the other hospital projects that are out there as well. I know the member from Grey Bruce would love to hear a question from you on the Marktail Hospital, for example, Speaker, but I am happy to say that we are going to be looking for, uh, forward to uh, uh, taking the next step when it comes to the new hospital in Niagara. That's an exciting initiative, Speaker, and I'm really pleased that it will be uh, that we're moving to uh, one more new hospital, Speaker, in a long, long line of new hospitals that are built under this government. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah, I don't think I actually got a straight answer there, Speaker. So let me let me let me try again on that. Answer your question. Yes, I'm confident that a PC government will get our economy growing and set priorities and fill in the projects around the province. The problem is, the only way to get you guys to do something is when a seat is at risk. The only way we actually get you to do something like a subway to Scarborough is when you're worried about losing a seat. Witness in Windsor, when you had a seat at risk in Windsor, you suddenly move with great speed to announce a mega hospital for Windsor. You announced a planning grant there in the millions of dollars in a matter of months. Dr. Smith's report has been out for over a year now, and you still don't answer the basic questions. Now, I caution you, don't do what the NDP is doing. I mean, they're trying to be all things to all people, everything under the sun. Their main motive, protecting the seat of the member for Welland as opposed to what's in the best Question. interest of health care for the people in Niagara region. I know the game they're playing. I just want to know what game you're playing. You did it for Windsor during a by-election. Whatever the cause, by-election or not, it's the right thing Thank to do. You. Will you green light that plan? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, I'm just going to suggest that the Leader of the Opposition talk to some of his colleagues who actually have been proud to be at the opening of hospitals in their community. Maybe you could speak to the member from Barrie. He was there and happy to be at the opening of that hospital, Speaker. The member from Cambridge, I think, will be very pleased with the redevelopment moving ahead 
in Cambridge. Just yesterday, I was in Burlington, Speaker, with the member from Burlington, the Conservative member from Burlington, where we talked about rescoping the project at Burlington so they will have a brand new emergency department, a seven story tower, Speaker. This is all good news. I've been in Milton with the member from, uh, from Halton, Speaker, who, uh, who's been very pleased to, uh, to Answer. be here for the groundbreaking, the ribbon cutting, whatever it is, Speaker. This province and welcome to the party. Thank you. A little bit late, but welcome, Speaker. Thank you. Your question to the member from Kitchener Mountain, uh, Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long Term Care and Health. Recent reports from Hamilton tell us our area is amongst the worst in Hamilton or in Ontario when it comes to seniors finding a space in a long term home care. In the, in the Hamilton area, seniors can expect to wait up to three and a half years to get placed. They're being subjected to terrible stress and crisis before being forced to jump through never-ending hoops in order to get the care they need. The local CCAC has said that their hands are tied by government legislation. Is the minister going to address the problems that are forcing seniors into homelessness and other terrible situations? Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Uh, speaker, well, thank you for the question, and I would be very interested if there are cases of seniors being forced into homelessness. Speaker, I would hope the member opposite would bring that to my attention. Speaker, uh, I think it's it's important to note that yes. There is a wait for long-term care, but yes, thankfully, here, Speaker, as a result of the superb work that is question. being done by our lands, by our CCACs, by the organizations that they're responsible for, we are seeing the wait time yeah, for long-term care homes decline. That's an extraordinary change, Speaker. It's happening because we are spending more to get more people the care they need in their own yeah. home. This is the a foundational part of our transformation of our health care system to provide the right care at the right time, in the right place, and the right place is home whenever possible. Thank you. Supplementary. As the crisis in long-term care unfolds, we are hearing of ridiculous decisions being made that bump seniors who have already been on the, been on the wait list for years. After four years, 92-year-old Marion Forrest finally got a space, but the day before she was supposed to move in, she was taken to the hospital. And Due to her very short stay in the hospital, she wasn't able to be there during that move, and she lost her space. She ended up with nowhere to live. 88-year-old Antoinette DeFalco was given two possible placements. Both of them were entirely inappropriate. One was in a unit for Alzheimer's and de dementia, which she is not, and the other one was to be shared with a woman who has to live in total darkness at all times. Because she Question. rejected these two offers, she was kicked off the waiting list. Again, I will ask the minister to end this shameful treatment of our seniors to ensure Thank that you. the long-term care system works for them and not Thank against you. them. Speaker, absolutely, and uh, I think the member opposite uh, would acknowledge that we have opened 500 long-term care beds in Hamilton since 2003. Speaker, so we are making progress, and I also want to clarify that if someone is in hospital, Speaker, um, they uh, uh, and cannot move into the long-term care home, they retain their space on that wait list. So they will be cared for, Speaker, until they, another vacancy comes up and they can move into the long-term care home of their choice. So, Speaker, we're doing our very best to provide the right care for seniors, Speaker, and we will, uh, we will continue this work. It's important work, Speaker, but I think it's important the member opposite actually understands the policy. Thank you. New question, the member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of the Environment. Oh, good, good question. Speaker, over the years, constituents from my riding of Oakville and the region of Halton have been raising serious concerns regarding the toxic con contamination of the Randall Reef, located just down Lake Ontario shoreline in Hamilton. The sediment of the Randall Reef site in Hamilton Harbour is contaminated with coal tar. Chemicals in coal tar are toxic, obviously, and they're harmful to aquatic life in the harbour. 
With the cleanup of the Sydney, Nova Scotia tar ponds in progress, the Randall Reef site is now the largest coal tar contaminated sediment site in all of Canada. So, Speaker, through you, would the Minister please share with the House what the Ontario government is doing to protect the health of Lake Ontario and its aquatic life from the contaminated Randall Reef in Hamilton Harbour? Thank you. Minister of the Environment. Well, I would like to thank the member for what is uh, an excellent question. The uh, provincial government, as members of the House would know, is committed to the remediation of contaminated sites all over the Great Lakes. Exactly. Province of Ontario, through the Ministry of the Environment, has committed to an investment of $46.3 million here, here. for the cleanup of Randall Reef in Hamilton Harbour. The Ministry of the Environment has partnered with Environment Canada and others, including Partnership. municipal partners in the City of Hamilton, City of Burlington, Region of Halton, U.S. Steel Canada, and Hamilton Port Authority. I am pleased that all funding partners have now finalized agreements great to news. move forward with the cleanup. Great. The cleanup of Randall Reef represents a significant Answer. step towards delisting Hamilton Harbour as an area of concern. We look forward to working with all partners as this you. project moves yeah, forward. That's great. Thank you, Speaker. That's excellent news about the commitment to the remediation of Randall Reef. I think all constituents are going to be pleased to hear that this contamination down the shore is a very important concern of the government and is going to be dealt with appropriately. Changing the image of Hamilton Harbour to a place with restored water quality and sustainable ecosystems should also increase property values and should lead to the growth of commercial business. Constituents in my riding of Oakville understand the importance of the Great Lakes to this province. This they up. understand that the Great Lakes provide drinking water to more than 80 per cent of the people of Ontario, as well as recreation, power generation, economic prosperity. But they also understand, Speaker, that the Great Question. Lakes are in trouble. So, Speaker, through you, would the minister explain what the government's doing to ensure that the Randall Reef exercise and remediation is not the end and the work continues? Minister. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This government recognizes that the Great Lakes are vitally important to the people of Ontario for our drinking water, for our quality of life, and our prosperity. Scientists tell us, however, that we're facing new challenges that are overwhelming old solutions. We need new initiatives to restore and protect the Great Lakes. That is why we've introduced Bill 6 the proposed Great Lakes Protection Act. Right. The Great Lakes Protection Act is designed to give that. the province new tools to restore and protect our Great Lakes so they're drinkable, swimmable, and fishable. We are grateful to all members of this House for their input on Bill 6. I think we have an opportunity together, together to achieve considerable success in this province with the passage Thank of this you. legislation. Oh. New question, the member from Durham. My question is to the Minister of the Environment. Minister, the Clarington Transformer Station was to be built on the Oak Ridges Moraine and has been before your ministry for about four or five years. Originally, this plan was a small-scale transformer station and received the appropriate environmental assessment. However, Hydro One has then increased the size of the transformer station without the necessary environmental assessments. The Oak Ridge's brain is home, as you know, to the largest aquifer in North America. Dr. John Cherry, an expert in hydrogeology from Guelph University, was retained by the Inniskillen Environmental Association to conduct an independent review of the environmental study to date. And Dr. Cherry concluded that the class environmental assessment was completely inadequate. Insufficient well monitoring infrastructure has been installed and the appropriate hydrological study has not been conducted. And the cost of the project will vastly exceed the original estimate of Question. $280 million. Minister, we will ask you to ask Hydro One to, to move the transformer station from the Oak Ridges Marine and protect the drinking water of millions of Thank people. Thank you. Yeah. Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I want to inform the House, first of all, that the member <laughs> has taken the opportunity to communicate with me on numerous occasions about this by means of letters which have been forthcoming, so I, exactly. I want to recognize that as uh, happened so far. Great the environmental assessment uh, process requires 
projects to be developed in a way that is protective of human health and the environment, and time is taken to ensure that all of these standards and objectives are met. The Ministry of the Environment has received some 56 requests asking that an individual environmental assessment is undertaken for the proposed Clarington Transformer Station. The Ministry of the Environment Answer. officials are now reviewing those requests and all input will be given very serious consideration before determination is made as to the bump-up bump request. Who writes your Thank you very much for that uh, response and the compliment, Minister. But, Minister, last week, uh, the Vice President of OPA, the Ontario Power Authority, Amir Shalabi, was addressing the Durham Strategic Energy Alliance. And, of course, the main topic of the day was the uncertainty around the nuclear uh, energy sector completely. However, at the meeting, Mr. Shalabi stated, and I quote in the media report that said, uh, the OPA supports Hydro One's plan to build the station on the Oak Ridge's Moraine in Clarington. This raises the question of a senior executive at the OPA making an open statement about his approval long before this approval you've just addressed has even been brought to the attention of the minister, I'm sure, and it's been for the ministry's uh, assessment to review process. I'm asking you to today to do due diligence on the progress, give options, look at options for the relocation of this site long before you forge ahead and ruin the aquifers on the Oak Ridges Marine, or at least do the appropriate studies. Of course, uh, that is why we have a very comprehensive and extensive environmental assessment process, which often is criticized by members of the, the yeah. members' party. You I know he hasn't done so, but critic. some of his other colleagues are very critical of the environmental assessment process. Yes, I want to, I, I want to say to the member that the 56 requests asking for the individual environmental assessment, uh, they're all being given various consideration. The individual to whom you has, have made uh, reference has no more influence or, exactly. or uh, sway over this particular decision than any of the 56 people who have already asked that there be a consideration for what we call a bump up Answer. or more extensive individual environmental assessment. I want to assure the member that consideration will be very serious and extensive. Thank you. New question, the member from Bramley for Malton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, there are legal aid clinics in our communities that provide an integral and fundamental service. They provide us with access to justice. And there are clinics that provide services to historically vulnerable groups like Aboriginal people, seniors and the disabled, and there are those groups that provide services to geographic areas. In the region of Peel, we have two centres, but based on population, the region of Peel has 1.3 million residents. However, when we look at funding, we receive half of the funding of other municipalities when it comes to a per capita basis. Now, fair share for Peel is, a, is no stranger. It's, a, it's not a strange issue to Peel. We've been underfunded on many issues and in many areas. I'm asking Question. the Minister today, Mr. Speaker, will he commit to ensuring that the residents of Peel receive their fair share when it comes to access to justice? Well, as the member well knows, we are committed to making sure that legal aid is available throughout the province of Ontario for those individuals that need it. And it's with that in mind that this government, even in tough economic times, when our budget isn't balanced yet, allocated an additional $30 million specifically for family law and to the legal aid clinics. We have been working with Legal Aid Ontario over the last uh, four to five months since the budget was passed to make sure that the funding uh, goes to the, those clinics that need the funding speaking. I, uh, the Ministry of the Attorney General truly believes in the clinic system. We want to fund them, and that's why the additional funding was made available. And I'm sure that Peel will get its, uh, its appropriate uh, resources. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.